in, in a moment. So let's read together. First Peter chapter 5, 1 through 4. Actually, I'll do 1 through 5. Um, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you took this uh, burly fisherman, Peter, and you inspired him by the, the Holy Spirit to write down some instructions for us here over 2,000 years later uh, to follow as an example of what, what it should be like in church life. So again, I just pray that your Holy Spirit will teach us today and that we learn more about you and your word. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we come to chapter 5, the end of uh, this letter that Peter's written. And I want you to keep that in mind, that this is Peter, this, uh, you know, rough, rugged man who God called. Uh, and Jesus saw him one day, it says, fishing, you know, and uh, he, he was called by the Lord Jesus Christ. And his brothers were the first to actually hear the call, and they told Peter about what they experienced in meeting Jesus and they came to Jesus he, they all came every one of them the 12 apostles they came to Jesus and the word of God says that they dropped everything to follow Jesus we heard that about Matthew Matthew was a tax collector he dropped everything and followed Jesus there's a sermon in that right there let me ask a question are you willing to drop everything to follow Jesus oh Let's not go there anyway. <laughs> Think about it. That's a tough one. That is tough. If we're to follow Jesus, what are, what are we willing to give up? What are we willing to say, I, I want to leave that behind because now following Jesus is more important. So we looked at this letter written by Peter the first thing we come across, I just want to recap a little bit, five minutes, because it really puts chapter five in perspective when we do that. And so we looked at this letter beginning in verse three in chapter one, talking about being born again to a living hope. A living hope. Born again. Coming to know Jesus Christ. That's our living hope in this day and age, right now. Not in man, not in money, not in possessions, not in all those things that man says we need to achieve. It's in Jesus Christ, that's our living hope. Amen. When we get to that point of leaving this earth to go to the next destination, and by the way, when we leave this earth, there's only two destinations. It's either heaven or hell. Don't often hear about hell. Well, the Bible's full of stories about hell. And if we're not right with Jesus Christ, when it's our time to leave this earth, and we don't accept him as Lord and Savior, then we're gonna to go to hell. No two ways about it. And so this is why the word of God is so important that we get it now, we understand it now. And you and I, when we're born again, as it says in the beginning, we have a living hope. Whatever goes on in our life between now and that time, uh, and by the way, there's some stuff that sucks, that really is awful. Stuff that goes on in your life and my life that we, we, we suffer from. We, we go through day after day. As we looked at and we'll see in some of these scriptures, suffering comes with following Jesus Christ. We're not exempt from it. It's not come to Jesus Christ and all your problems will be solved. That's not a gospel of truth. It's come to Jesus Christ and you will experience suffering. 
you will experience the trials. I've gone through some of the stuff that you guys have gone through over ministry years here in, in Sarasota. And, and I tell you, it's affected me more than you know. When people have lost loved ones. When a little baby is born and then dies at birth. It's happened to a couple in our church. When people lose loved ones... And you bury your kids. We're talking about that this morning. Before you go as an adult. The stuff that goes on health wise. Cancers. Afflictions. Financial issues. You name it. We will go through it. But we go through it together as a family. Because we have a living hope in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what he wants us to understand. As we open this letter. Everything else that follows is built on that living hope. Everything. And so we come into this letter in the end of the first chapter. He wants us to become holy as he is holy. When you become a Christian, you give your life to Jesus Christ. It's only the beginning. It's about then getting close to who Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ came as, as an example for you and I on this earth. And he wants you and I to follow him. And try and be who he was. It's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. But we have to try. And we have to seek to do that. Which is the right thing. We have to seek to do those things. That before we became believers. We know are wrong. So we've got to undo some of the things in life. And again. Seeing some of you guys. I know what you were like. Before you became Christians. And, and, and how... That life was wrong. My life was the same. Before I came to know Jesus Christ, my life was wrong. In many, many ways. I didn't think so. I mean, I thought I was perfect, you know. I mean, stop laughing, I don't know. But you know what? There are people who think that. They're going through life thinking, I'm okay. I, 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 I don't do big stuff wrong. I don't do this. I don't do that. But the Bible says we're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. And so we need to now come and try and emulate Jesus Christ and be holy. And then in, in the end of chapter 1, it talks about, again, being born again. Of, of, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. Through the living and abiding word of God. We looked at how important the Word of God is. And how you and I need to feed off it. And then into chapter 2. It talks about being born again. Yes, in chapter 1. But because of that, we now, as it begins chapter 2. So, therefore, put away all malice, deceit, hip hypocrisy, envy, slander. And so, as we're growing into our faith, these things are going to get less and less and less. Because in verse 9, it says we're a chosen race, a royal priesthood. Every single one of us are ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not just me or the leaders. God calls us. He wipes the slate clean when we become born again. When we give our lives to him. And then he, we're inducted into the school of ministry. We become royal priests. And we are the ones that serve him. That's what this verse is all about. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then as we continue in chapter 2, we look to the whole issue of submission. Submission is, is a big theme. Suffering is a big theme. And submission is so important. Starts off with submission to authorities, to those in government, to those in the church, to those at school. All authorities it was talking about here. But if you remember, we said if those authorities contradict and contravene the word of God, then we don't follow them. Amen. So the word of God is, is the most important thing. 
And so we, we, we majored on that in one of the messages. So submission to authorities. And then in chapter 3, we got into the whole area of submission in the household of, of family. Chapter 3, wives be submissive to your own husband. We looked at that in a godly way. And we're talking in a biblical godly way. This is not so that the husband can domineer the wife and beat her down and trample on her. He took the, the, the part of the man which was the rib from his side so she could come alongside him, not from his foot, so he could trample on her. Very important. That's godly submission. It's if we, took, we talked about it, put it in perspective. If we submit to God, I believe if any woman submits to God, they'll have no trouble in submitting to man. Because it's in God's way. It's in God's way. And that's what Peter was talking about here. But here's the rub. Here's the kicker with this. Verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you. Again, preachers have preached on that. Oh, the woman is so weak. You have to be, you know, over her in this dimension. In my Bible, this verse, this chapter, is linked to Ephesians 5, where it talks about the husbands loving your wives as Christ loved the church and laid his life down for the church. The church is a picture of the family of God. Christ laid his life down. And it's the same with the husband. It's the picture of the husband laying his life down in the family for his wife. That he would do anything for her. He would take a bullet for her. He would, he would go through everything for her. But because Peter's writing this from the Holy Spirit, there's an order here. God has given us an order. That is a godly order. Because without the order, then chaos ensues. This is the purpose of Scripture. It's from the very beginning of time. God created, there was an order, there was God's creation. He created man and woman, that's God's order. Not man and man or woman and woman, it's God's order. And when God's order is not followed, then it's out of context. It's out of the way that God intended it to be. This is so important. Then in verse 8, all of you, finally all of you, have unity of mind. Unity in the body. Unity in the church. All of those things are really so important. And then as we continue into chapter 4, we had it at the end of chapter 3. Uh, suffering was, was a big thing for followers of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> chapter 4, suffering again, whoever has suffered in the flesh. Again, it's so important. Verse 8, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Love is so important in the dynamics of church life. And again, verse 12, we looked at two weeks ago, suffering. Suffering as a Christian. Peter's writing this. He wants us to get things. And now as he looks at chapter 5, he wants us to get something else. That as there's God's order in creation... As there's God's order in the family, there's also God's order in the church. Wow, can you imagine that? Having an order of things that is godly. I don't know if you've noticed as you look about creation, everybody's trying to create different things, to do different things. They're trying to say that, well, it, it kind of just happened. There are people out there now saying the earth's flat. You know, I, I mean, there's so many amazing things out there. You, you'd be surprised. And then with, with, with family life, there, there's people out there trying to suggest that there's a different way than a godly way. That somebody who's born a male or a female can change and, and, and be different. No, they can't. It's God's order. Husband, wife. God's order. 
guys, we're in, we're in a, a time now where, where man is trying to take the place of God. Or betide them. Because they're messing with the creator of the universe. Now we come to church life. And Peter is pointing out that we have to now have in the church the same dynamic that we have in the family. There's chaos in the family because God's order has been abused. There's chaos in the church because God's order has been abused. So now Peter wants us to understand, like he did with Christian suffering, that there's also Christian leadership in the church. And how the, the, the Christians who were new in that day, most of them Gentiles, they hadn't got an understanding of Jewish leadership anyway. So that was a good thing. But even if they had, they now had to hear the teaching of God's way into the future of every Christian church. Not man's way, not religion's way, but God's way. Um, and as we look at verse 1, Peter was now letting them know that he himself, as an elder, do you hear that? I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder, he's not the Pope, not as, a, not as a Pope or the most chosen apostle of Jesus Christ, not as the most favorite of Jesus, not as the, no, as an elder, a fellow elder, somebody on the same level as the other elders. So what does Peter tell us? about the role of this leadership in the church. First and foremost, I want to suggest that this role is so important, it's a calling, not a career. I've heard so many people say, oh, I want to be a pastor, I want to do this, I want to, I want to go here, I want to do this. Uh, and I think I'll, I'll do this for three years and maybe do that for another four years. And do... It's a calling. When God calls you, he equips you, that's the first thing. But he also tells you and sends you where he wants you to go. You don't pick and choose what you want to do. It's God's calling on your life. We are here because God called us. I'm not here because I looked one day and I thought, well, Florida looks nice. I, I, I like the weather. It, it's a little bit better than where I'm living right now. If I could choose somewhere in the world, it, it would be Florida. But I didn't choose it. You need to hear this. I, I didn't want to come to Florida to leave all my family. Because that's the difference. I don't care if it's Hawaii, Florida, you, you name it. If, you, if your family's not with you, you can be anywhere in the world. But God called us. And he called us to come without our family. Wow, that was tough. Fortunately, and, and an answer to prayer, one of our daughters came with us. That was God's design. You, some of you know that story. How Gemma came and how God wanted her to leave the life that she was living and come and be, be part of what we were doing and rededicate her life to the Lord. And how the Holy Spirit got hold of her. And how at one point her and Julie sat down and, you know, Ask God to forgive the life that she'd led and all of those things. And she's going to be totally embarrassed when she hears this back on, on the video. <laughs> Sorry, Gemma. But that was God's order. That was God's calling. And how she then began to say, Lord, use me. And he called her into youth work and children's ministry. And today, she's in there with our kids, teaching them the Bible. You, you don't have to worry, any of you parents, that she's getting the Word of God in, in a most amazing way to our kids in that room in there. Amazing. Some of you all else go in there as well. It starts in the nursery with our babies. And then they graduate into to the, to Gemma's class. And then they go into 
you know, teenage years and, and they have Bible study in the middle room over there. So again, the calling is where we're at and what Peter is trying to demonstrate in, in this teaching here. In the, in the Bible, again, in Acts chapter 11, chapter 14, chapter 17, number of those scriptures, it talks about the dynamic of an elder in a church. And you can read them for yourselves. And then Paul writes to Timothy and Titus a detailed description of the character qualities of men who serve as elders and deacons in the church. By the way, there's only two positions of leadership in any church. Elders and deacons. All this cardinal and... Oh, anyway, I, I, I won't name the hundreds of, 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 of places where people say, oh, I, I'm, I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a the other. Elders and deacons is where God wanted the church, the church, the New Testament church, to focus on leadership. Let me turn to, to Titus as we look at it. Same in, in, in Timothy. They're both the same. One describes the role of elder, the other describes elders and deacons. And it gives you the qualifications in, in Titus uh, chapter 1, Timothy in chapter 3, look them up please. This is why I left you in Crete, this is Paul talking to Tim and Titus, so that you might put what remained into order, this is the order of the church, and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound drop doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Read the same in, in 1 Timothy. This is where God wants us to understand about this role. And again, there's been a lot of discussion in terms of whether it's male or female. There's some who will say it can be open to both. For me, when it talks about the husband of one wife, that is very specific. And how that is God's order of things, because it mirrors the family. That's why God said the church is the family. That's why God wants you to understand that Christ is likened to the bridegroom. And the church is the bride. It's all biblically connected intertwine this picture that God wants us to have and, and I read and hear most commentators, theologians understand that the elder and deacon are both male again there are some churches that will accept either or both I'm not sure how that works I really don't because again, there's a conflict of dynamics between male and female. It's not that God doesn't want a woman to be in service in a church, because the woman is just as important as the man. I couldn't do or be what I am without Julie being by my side and supporting and praying and being there. It, 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 I said this last week, we had a leadership meeting where we met and talked about church life. At the end of the meeting, I said, and our wives were waiting, call the ladies in. I want them to be in our final prayer to acknowledge that they're just as part of this ministry as we are. That's the dynamic of church leadership. It's powerful together. And when churches start to, to divide and separate over, well, whether they have a woman deacon or woman elder or not or certainly not a pastor of a church that's not biblical 
Because we could go into all the scriptures that says a woman should not teach. Should not teach a man. Let's get it right. People say, oh, that was cultural. It, God knew it was important to last a lifetime. And so we haven't got to make it controversial. We have to make it biblical and say, well, this is God's dynamic. Let me tell you, a lot of the work in this church is done by women. Because God's use of them, absolutely. They're, they're just as much use, used in a church as the person who has that position. And so again, this is how God intended it. It's really important that we should understand this. And so as Peter's writing this down, he wants people in the future, in the churches of the future, to understand what the dynamics of an elder are. That Titus reading and Timothy reading gives the attributes, the qualities, the characteristics, and of the calling placed on those who are elders chosen to shepherd the flock. And for the church to flourish over a long period of time, I don't think it's enough to have a nice building. I don't think it's enough to have effective programs. I hate programs. I don't think it's uh, enough to even have uh, a charismatic pastor. A charismatic pastor is not biblical. The pastor is an elder like Peter is. I'm an elder with the other elders. I'm the first amongst equals as God calls me to pastor the flock. That's the responsibility God has called me to. And so as we leave here, as we look here, as we, we look at this career aspect of, of eldership, in verse 2, Peter uses two statements that explain what elders do. They're shepherds of God's flock. I don't know any church that advertised for a, a leader, a pastor, uh, and put that as a qualification on it. Are you a shepherd? Are you a shepherd? Shepherd of God's flock. The congregation is the flock. The people are the sheep. And sheep need a shepherd. Why? Because sheep are vulnerable, but they're also valuable. What did Jesus do when there was one sheep who strayed? He went after the one sheep. We should go after the sheep that gets lost, who is lost, who doesn't know Jesus Christ. That's what the shepherd does. What a shepherd is to sheep, so an elder is to the congregation. Everything a shepherd does, an elder does. He feeds the sheep. He leads the sheep. He protects the sheep. That's what Jesus was indicating in, in John chapter 10. The shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's the ultimate. I've, I've known supposed shepherds who at the first hurdle of, of bolted, uh, I need to look for somewhere else. I need, to, I need to get another job somewhere else. It's not a job. It's, it's a calling that God gives that we should listen to and, and, and respond to. And Peter uses another statement to describe what the elder does. They serve as overseers or exercising oversight. It, it's the word, it's the Greek word where you get episkopos from, which is to gaze upon something, to gaze over somebody. And I believe God has entrusted the entire congregation to the elders' care. And he gazes over everyone. Not, by the way, just those who are rich. <laughs> I know people who do that. I heard one pastor say to me, when I was doing benevolent stuff, my ministry is to rich people. 
I'll not tell you what I said after that, but anyway. <laughs> and so when God calls, he also equips. So look at the calling of an elder and his qualifications. What should the elder's attitude be? What should be towards his ministry that God gives him? Verse 2, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. You know, to have an elder in leadership who doesn't really want to be there, or any leader for that matter, I believe it will end in disaster. I heard one guy say, well, I was asked and I didn't really want the job anyway, but I didn't want to say no. That's not the reason to be a leader in any church. And that will never work for such an important, called, appointed God position within the church environment. Because you know what, being a, an elder or a deacon, it's not easy, it's exhausting, it demands, it demands so many things, demands the wisdom of Solomon, the patience of Job more than most, the courage of David, the kingly character of Daniel, the administrative ability of Nehemiah, the compassion of Hosea, many, many other attributes. That's why the elders of any church need to lead the church because they believe God has called them to the ministry. No other reason. And then some elders will be called into full-time ministry. Like I was called into full-time. There's a difference between being an elder in the church and it being a voluntary place and those who God calls to full-time ministry. There's a difference in the sense that not everybody is, is open to be able to do that if they have different responsibilities. Having said that, I believe God called me out of my responsibility of working in a secular job into ministry in a God-called appointed job. And that was a miracle. That was a miracle. And most of you know that story. And so, why is that important? Because in, in everything that an elder does, a called full-time minister does, they need to know that God is with them. And so when that happens, then uh, God leads them into full-time ministry, into a church. The church then will need to support them and their families. And that's why... In this next attitude, it's towards his compensation. Verse 2, not greedy for money, but eager to serve. You know, there's nothing wrong with receiving money for full-time ministry. It's a perfectly, perfectly biblical principle. But there are those who see that as the prime reason to go into full-time ministry. I know uh, leaders who ask for their package what is my package? You know, God called us to, to minister in Florida. I didn't know what I was going to get before I came here. I had, I had other ministers say, oh, so what are you on? I, I don't know. What, what's your package? I, I don't know. I just came. I believe if God called me, he, he would supply all my needs. I didn't find that out until about the second week of starting the position at, at my other place. Didn't know it. God looked after me. I had no worries about that. When I first became a full-time elder back however many years ago uh, in the church, and I was an elder at that point, I hadn't become a pastor, uh, God called me and they, they said, we, we'd like you to go full-time in the church. What, what do you think your you know, remuneration would be? I said, I don't know. I said, I, I don't really have any idea. I'll leave it with you guys. And guess what? They gave me enough to pay my bills. That was all I worried about. That was all that I was concerned about. But I know those out there who lay this, 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 and this down as a condition. If I don't get this, then I'm not going. I don't, I don't kind of 
see the connection between a calling of God. So towards compensation is, is really important, not greedy for money, but eager to serve. But if money is the primary motive, then I believe there's something wrong. The Bible has a particular word for a person who's in the ministry for money. That word is called a hireling. It's a hireling. In other words, they will come for a particular amount of money. What's another attitude? It's his attitude towards people. Verse 3, not lording it over those entrusted to you, being examples to the flock. This is talking about the elder who abuses his power, who rules within the church like a tyrant, loves the power, the authority, the adulation that comes with the position. But the power has corrupted them. The power has given them ideas above their station to put it in a secular way it's been said that there are two kinds of leaders there are demand leaders and command leaders demand leaders say do what I say because I'm in charge command leaders say follow my example good elder doesn't demand leadership but by the quality of his life and biblical direction he commands it I believe such a person is easy to follow his life backs up what he says and I believe nothing inspires confidence at a time of difficulty more than a, a, a godly leader who cheerfully shows the way and by the way this this quality applies to every leader in, in every church. Deacons, Bible study teachers, youth leaders, children's leaders, evangelism leaders, those who serve the Lord. If the person is right, the sheep will follow. And again, if you think about who's writing this, Peter. The man who reacted with his head and not with his heart. The man who always did something before he even thought about what he did. Never looked at the consequences. But now, after Pentecost, after preaching and leading people to Jesus Christ, he's now a different leader, a different attitude. Like I said before, he could have started this section off Look here, I'm Peter, follow me or else. Could have done that. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder. His attitude is now governed by his heart and not by his head. That's what verse 5 is all about. It's about humility. It's about looking at how we do things and how life has got to be in God's order God's time and so as we come to a close today I want us to be really sure that, that God has put order in, in, in the, the here and now he did it a long time ago he did it at creation he did it when Jesus came and he's doing it now but unfortunately along the way man has tried to disrupt God's order of things and you and I have to be strong. You and I have to be biblical. You and I have to say, I'm going to follow this God because he's the God of order and I want God's order in my life, not man's order. Because finally, this morning, for those who lead in this way, there's going to be a reward. The leader's reward. The, re the responsibility of a leader is so much more onerous than it is on anybody else. Those in Bible study who teach, they have to have more accountability to God than anybody else. Those who are leading astray, those flock, those sheep who are under their teaching or under their instruction, they're going to be more accountable if they lead them astray and they're going to understand God's judgment when that happens. But for those who lead in a godly way, it's not going to be popular. 
it's not going to be what the world thinks. Oh, we have to have, you know, equality everywhere and, you know, we've got to have everything how we want it. Well, if we lead in God's way, then all that matters is what God thinks, Amen. not what man thinks. And God says in verse 4, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Two things. The chief shepherd is Jesus Christ. He's the chief shepherd in this church. He's the leader in this church. I might be the physical presence, but if I do anything against God's will, I have to answer. It's Him. As we come and we pray as elders and deacons and seek God, it's because He's directing us. I don't want to just do, oh, this, there's a program here, a program there. No, we have to do ministry as God shows us ministry. And do it that way. It's under him, the chief shepherd. And then as he appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. One day Jesus is coming back. When that day comes, that's when everything that's gone on up until that point, all the stuff of ministry, all the good, the bad, the ugly, all the ups, the downs, all the tears and the laughter, all of the things, all the things that might want to make any leader say, I'm done, I'm, I'm, I'm gone. All the things of life that happened in ministry up until that point, one day Jesus is going to say, well done, well done. You did what the Bible asked you to do. Well done. All I can say is, please hurry up, Lord Jesus. Please hurry up. I think a lot of us are weary. So let's just come to a close today. I, I'm thankful in this fellowship. One of the things we prayed when we this ministry was, was started. Lord, bring those Christians already mature enough to be part of our leadership, to be part of this ministry who can be trustworthy, who would lead, lead committees, who would lead ministries, who I could just trust and leave to get on with things. Because like in, in Acts when they called deacons in the church, it was because the word was being ignored. So other leaders became part of that team. So they could help out. They could do. And God brought some amazing leaders into this church. Men and women in other leadership roles. So I just want to thank you all. If you're here this morning and you're in a position of eldership, deacon, committee, Bible study, whatever that is, worship, if you're involved in worship, it's, it's so important in this church. It's leading us into the throne room of God. If, if you're welcoming on the door, you, you, you're important in this church. You, you're being the hand of Jesus that says welcome when somebody walks through the door. If somebody comes, like when, when some of the, the guys come early in the morning and, and hands you a cup of coffee and says, I've, I've done a cup of coffee for you this morning. I, that blows my mind. Not just makes it, but hands the cup of coffee to you. It's all important. It's all part of the ministry. God's called us. And I'm so thankful for all you who are involved in that. I want to pray that as we finish today, this is not particularly a, a gospel message, but it's part of the teaching of the gospel, which is the church, which is who we are as followers of Jesus Christ. And that's the criteria. We have to be followers of Jesus Christ first. We can't just be part of ministry without knowing who Jesus Christ is. That's my heart this morning. I want people to serve more than anything. 
but I want them to know Jesus Christ as the main priority. To do it for him, not to do it because. Again, I prayed a prayer of salvation last week. If you don't know Jesus Christ, please come and talk to me at the end. I'd love to pray that prayer with you. That's where ministry begins. You too can give your life to the one that I gave my life to all those years ago and said, Lord, I want to serve you. I didn't know he was going to call me to this place. I really didn't. He's called me. And it's part of what God's plan was. You just think, if you come to Jesus Christ, that moment, God has got a plan for your life. It could be so exciting. It could be amazing. Let's pray for it.